become a very valued friend in my life and uh, um, he's uh, introduced me to this wonderful group which I, I feel like I moved back 50 years to the 60s. And I <laughs> Most of you probably don't realize that the building code, the today's building code for earthquake safe structures provides for an expectation the building will be damaged and may be damaged beyond repair. That it has reduced the f earthquake forces of the expected earthquake down so you can do what's called a linear elastic calculation in the uh, design of these structures with the expectation that the building will be broken but not collapsed. That meets the minimum standards that they have determined in the building code. Otherwise, it would be uneconomic to build it. This doesn't apply to nuclear power plants and the hospitals and things like that, but it applies to houses and all of the commercial buildings in the downtown. So, knowing that, it's, a, it's important to, to sort of realize that when we're dealing with heritage structures and, and historical building systems, there is an expectation of damage. So that if you have a damaged building that's a natural building after an earthquake, in a design level earthquake and it's gotten damaged, that means it met the building code standard. Even if a building material, whether it be masonry, unreinforced masonry, whatever, be not in the code. So that's an important point because all of the kinds of approaches that you folks are making to try to get sort of non-standard technologies approved, meeting the intent of the code is the underlying really important thing. So, when I moved to California, I got involved with this whole subject because I'd come from New England and I loved masonry buildings. And of course, the, the California is confronted with this issue and I was told that immediately that um, these are all toast. They eventually got to go. They got to be converted to gunite and concrete and all of that uh, and just kept as facades. But I came from having done for, 10, for 20 years, a study of the New England textile mills, industrial buildings. So I've come at this not from small houses and, and building small, but building big. Building big for the first time in the history of the world, together with Britain. But these buildings were massive. One factory had made cloth in a mile a minute uh, with 15,000 employees in the buildings that ran for a mile along the river, driven by water power and then by steam power. And the American mills had wooden floors. They put the looms high up in the mill because the movement of the looms was buffered by the mill. In Britain, they had to be in a separate building because the buildings were made of masonry. So it was, it was an art of being able to design these buildings. This had a thousand looms on this floor and another thousand on the floor above. And this open floor space was magical. No shear walls inside, all a big open space. This is what they abandoned buildings before they were torn down. But here I show you what held it together. This is exactly what is now in the California Building Code for the retrofit of masonry buildings. And these, these, this design of these buildings was invented in the second decade of the 19th century. And it's these bolts that held the walls to the floors uh, that are now in the California Building Code to hold um, brick buildings together. Moving on to what really brings me to the subject of, of tonight and Nepal. It was those mills that taught me that masonry buildings do not need to fall down because if a building can, under can actually be rocking and rolling from a thousand looms going back and forth in it for 120 years, it can survive an earthquake. So now I'm in Kashmir. This is in 1981 was my first trip there. But this was like walking back 
into the medieval era. It was, uh, it was these narrow streets of seemingly tipping down buildings. And then when I um, uh, applied for the job in California and interviewed, and I, I began to study this to try to understand it because I knew the only way to preserve these buildings was to, to convince the modern people today, the people who live in them today, that they're in fact safe. Uh, and I discovered that in the 1880s there was an earthquake and these buildings remained standing and the palace fell down. Mm -hmm. And so why would that happen? But at the same time I discovered in the British Library that this canal had been filled in and made into a road, mm -hmm. urban renewal. But not the last one which was still there and I was able to photograph it and that's what it looked like. This magical world of buildings along a canal and lakes and and whatnot that most of the world doesn't know today because of the civil strife that exists there. These buildings are what attracted me and then I also uh, discovered, boom, uh, the kind of thing that I dealt with in New England and in Great Britain. This is the image of the city the concrete company has for the people to see. What would the meaning of that ever be there? The camel's nose was already under the tent. Even in 1981, when I shot this picture, that was what was next to it. This was an environment which was truly the natural building environment, and it's still at that time. And I saw people hand sawing timbers like that, without a sawmill. And so there were two types of construction that I saw that really made up the heritage buildings in the city. One that's uh, called, I called it talk because I was told that this is what it was called. In fact, the name that I've given it has now been applied to its structural type when this was really an architectural term and it's now stuck. But uh, Daji Dwari means patch quilt wall and it's essentially what in English we call half timber. So the question then is, how does it work in an earthquake? Because there was the threat of an earthquake. This is before the uh, 2005 earthquake. And this is a building that was under partial demolition. You can see that wall is a thin, again, a membrane. And that's what I meant taking the frame out of timber frame because the concept that that masonry is what's actually holding that building up is what I began to realize was really an essential uh, ingredient. But how do you see something like that as an earthquake proof structure? But there it was. And you see that the build, not even the windows line up. And the, and the piers, you shift over to there. It breaks almost every rule that you would imagine would be in the conventional wisdom book of how to have an earthquake safe structure. But there are even cold joints, uh, gaps be, uh, separating one panel of masonry from the other. And, and these are not small buildings. Uh, in fact, there, there was uh, quotes from a thousand years ago about these buildings being so tall. It was really through the migration of the Ottoman Empire and the, and, and, and the Iranian Empire that brought some of the uh, uh, technology into this valley. But you could see from that other picture, holding it up, a load-bearing masonry building held up on three points by long poles like that. <laughs> but this is what made it work, is timber in the walls. So these are actually reinforced masonry buildings. But it's this horizontal reinforcement, no vertical in this case. This is load-bearing construction. And, and at the very same time that I got involved with it, 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 there were other people in India that recognized the importance of this, people whom I know now, and put it in the building code. It's in the Indian building code and now also in the Nepali building code. I do want to show you some of the collisions of, of this with, um, with conventional wisdom as I experienced it. There was a small earthquake after the 1999 big earthquake in Turkey that most people haven't heard of, but it was, it was in the central part of Anatolia and it caused that level of damage to buildings of that same type, which were in, in Kashmir would be called Daji Dwari, and in Turkey is called uh, Humush Construction. And these wonderful little agrarian villages along rivers, well, what did the officials do? They came in and condemned these houses and offered them new houses 
but they, you know, it, with shared expenses to build them, but they were engineered and they were, but they said, well, this is a dangerous site because it might be a landslide, and they put them up way up here on the hillside, away from the town, and the what, town is down there. And then I discovered the one that hadn't been stuck up, excuse me, that's not earthquake safe. It doesn't even have a frame, never mind um, having any kind of seismic protections. And this huge concrete slab in the top and then a brittle uh, block instead of, uh, of uh, soft masonry that we've been hearing about this week. It, it's a disaster. That's more dangerous than the houses that they said were unsafe. And the houses that they said were unsafe are, in fact, that I've come to know now were perfectly safe. And you'll see uh, a restored example. The worst example was this town, way put way up on the top of the village, when, uh, of the hill, where the village is here in the valley. They had no mosque, no country store, and no barns for their animals, and no fertile soil where they put it. Eighty houses. Only five were occupied at the time I saw it. They rose to six and then fell back to five by the time I saw it some years after the earthquake. And um, it's never been occupied. And the people uh, never got any support for restoring their houses in the village. And they're the gentlemen of the village there. But there is a contrasting example, which is these, this town, which still had its younger families. And they took the ball in their own hands and they spurned the government um, assistance, which would have been to uh, remove these buildings and restored their buildings and went on with their lives as farmers in this, in this town. Mm -hmm. And it, it was really a difference between those towns which had lost their youth to the cities and those which were still on, on fertile soil and continued to be farming villages. Moving on to the Kashmir earthquake of 2005, this is a view of the damage in Pakistan. Concrete buildings and masonry buildings, rubble stone masonry buildings, completely tumbled down. That was an area where 80,000 people died, whereas only 9,000 died in Nepal. But few people here heard of this. I mean, it was really a small news event because nobody really cared or knew about Kashmir at that time. And Nepal, um, to its benefit, has lovers uh, all over the world who just love Nepal and love the, uh, uh, um, the world there that, uh, that exists. And so we've had uh, lots of information about that earthquake. But the, in Pakistan, here is one example of something that happened, and in the end it was more positive, because this followed slightly the Turkish example, and I think they've even learned to, some from that. But uh, rubble stone houses did badly, just as I showed before. In this uh, town, the country store uh, that was down the hill was Daji Dwari, and it only lost some panels, whereas the concrete uh, local store collapsed. But that house there, which had a, um, a dodgy dwari construction, uh, survived perfectly intact. So these families all got together, and that's the carpenter and the owner, and they built in the traditional style. They resurrected it. It hadn't been used in generations. Then the NGOs cottoned on to this, because how do you c carry concrete um, remote from the place uh, where it's made and how do you take it a remote from the road system even and deliver it and so they started trainings and they developed you know uh, different ways of doing it I've always argued against the diagonals in fact because it's the masonry that needs to do the walking and that's another whole story but here are the people lined up uh, taking in this information to build their own houses restoring to them the ability to do their own houses, and the government then approve, uh, approved it. In fact, I was asked to give a lecture in Islamabad, and two weeks after I gave a talk to the government's engineering team, they approved Daji Dwari, and one year later approved Batar construction, which is this. Yeah. <laughs> and this re resembles the construction in Nepal, which I'll get to. There's a, 
probably a quarter of a million new houses in northern Pakistan now constructed in traditional technology. So um, taking you back to Srinagar here, but when I was in Nepal the first time, bef well, you know, 15 years before the earthquake, I saw that these buildings in Nepal did not have this kind of timber lacing. And so therefore they were coming apart at the seams there and then I saw pictures of the 1934 earthquake and that same view became that. And this is the World Heritage Site of Patan. This has all been reconstructed. So what you're looking at largely are buildings that were reconstructed in 1934, not dating back to the, you know, the 16th, 17th, 18th century. Uh, this trip now, the one palace that had not been recently restored was the Hanumandoka Palace in central Kathmandu, where there was a collapse and there was a lot of damage, mainly to the 19th century wings, whereas the 18th century wing lost the tops of its tower, but the main building remained standing. That's what it looked like uh, when I was there. But going into this, I revealed that in fact this has timber lacing. So it was very interesting to discover that, in fact, there was some tradition there. It just wasn't as broad and as general. And in fact, the soft soil site of Srinagar was so much softer. It was really on the order of magnitude of Mexico City that they, if they didn't have timber lacing, the buildings would come apart even without an earthquake. <laughs> Here you see it's on the inside, just as it is in the building code in, in, uh, in the tutorial book that EERI has published that was in fact co-authored by a, a Nepali engineer who was, done his, did his training in uh, New Zealand, but he's a, now a top qualified engineer. So, Nepal. The higher you go into the Himalayan region, the less soil there is, so this, therefore the less clay there is, to a point where you essentially have dry laid stone, with, there's, you see there are no trees here either, dry laid stone and slate are the materials you have to build a house. So come an earthquake, you uh, have a problem of, of essentially a high frequency vibration coming through and making the stones come apart. The way the masons do it is that they are essentially laying the stones, their best stones, parallel to each other to form the inner and outer wife of the wall. And then they've put the, the uh, small broken pieces in between. Well, it results in the fact the wall is unbonded. And so the wall splits in an earthquake. And I discovered this when Roger Billam, the pr uh, premier seismologist of the Himalayan region, uh, sent this picture around to our uh, communications group and I see that they're just putting the clay really in the center of the wall here. They're not even laying it over the whole thing. And this is a new uh, post-earthquake reconstruction going on. And, and m many of the people demolished the second floor of their houses after this earthquake, even if they were in good shape. And some of them came through the earthquake just fine. In the lower areas where there was more clay, the only area we got to was further from the epicenter than Gorka, and, or the high area. Uh, so many of the houses did survive and some did fall down. So the question came to my mind, what about putting bands in the, in the buildings just as I saw that they were so effective in Kashmir? Uh, and also in Pakistan. So that, that's a remarkable turnabout from what we saw in the example I showed in Turkey. And what about Nepal, where we see that the damage to the traditional rural construction is so severe that keeping the same technology is not really an appropriate option if we're to try to make for a situation where the even the people who occupied these structures would feel safe in them again. And that's why many of the second floors were actually knocked off, buildings that could have been restored. So what about timber bands? I learned that there was a shortage of timber. Then what about concrete? Well, I, you know, I communicated with one engineer and said, do you really mean that? To carry this five kilometers up a hill and then down a path and then come back for another one? 
And then on top of that, is it how well is that going to work? Is it going to is the rebar not going to rust? Because it's all going to be hand done. And so and he turns to me and you want one of these and I say no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what else is possible? And the idea of what I have named Gabian bands uh, after the principle of Gabian baskets, which are used for landscape retention and uh, retaining walls and all of that sort of stuff. But I want to make sure that you understand that it's not baskets, it's uh, ring beams placed in the structure in a series of bands, ring beams around, where I wrap only one <coughs> course of masonry, a single course. And the idea of doing a single course is to keep this from getting loose or spreading as a basket, but keep being able to tie it up tight around a single course of masonry. Everything else in the construction of the building would remain the same as they have done it for hundreds of years, except for this one change. And so what was really interesting is to then get a call one day from some filmmakers for NOVA that had found out about my work through a, actually a family connection, but then saw my writings on the website and whatnot, and asked, to go there and to demonstrate this. And uh, what would have been really nice is to be able to do some engineering tests and all of that, but the deadline was such that they had to have a rough cut by September 15th, so we even had to go in the monsoon. So we could only go to certain areas that we could ex access in the monsoon, but even the foothills of the Himalayan mountains are bigger than the Appalachian mountains in this country. They're just, they're way up there. So I, you know, with great anxiety, the idea of showing up in a place and in a period of the only the five days that we would have with the filmmaker to do this, organize a building project with people I have no idea who they are. And they don't, have never seen me in their lives. And uh, through another American who, uh, whose wife is Nepali and has property there, we, uh, they had pick, picked a town, which is the one I showed that view from. And then I went, uh, I, I did go there. I mean, uh, I still didn't know how this would ever happen. I would probably demonstrate maybe a wall, um, you know, that would be so big and, and that would be it and, uh, and so on and so forth. So I then got, got taken by there drivers uh, to a hardware store in Kathmandu, uh, which was itself not to be believed. I mean, all of you are, you know, small, you know, entrepreneurs or business people, but can you imagine running a business like that? And, uh, I mean, this, this is the main store, not the dump behind. And then we go into the office and there are six people there with uh, cash registers and paper uh, tablets and things. But the amazing thing is that when you talk to the people, they knew where stuff was. How did you so get a picture found of my carport? <laughs> How did I what? How did you get a picture of my house? <laughs> <laughs> Does it say see you on the back of it? <laughs> so we made an executive decision that this would be all right. Uh, and uh, we, but imagine it took only two and a half of these rolls, which are individually carryable, they're not light, but they're carryable, to do an entire, the entire house that I'll show you. And so, uh, to compare it with the, uh, doing something like that would be bags and bags of concrete. Uh, I rest the case on, on the concrete issue right there, in terms of putting concrete bands in. There are lots of other technical reasons, but that's it. But now, I find myself here after the, the most intense jeep ride I've ever experienced, up in the height of this village. That is the place where the walk around we did. I found a cluster of fallen down houses that formed an entire family farm. And on that site, 
uh, was this ruin there. And I thought, okay, we could very quickly fashion this into an already existing foundation for the people who live there, and they agreed that they would love to see us build a house for them, or us organize the construction for them to build the house. Because it was the family and two masons that they we engaged, and, 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 the, and the filmmakers paid them a salary to build the house. And, and they, that was the access path I just showed you. So it was off the road. And this was the main family house ruin that I found on the site. And comparing the masonry was rather interesting because I was wondering why did this one fall down and this one remained standing. And there was a subtle differences that I could see in the masonry. And particularly what was interesting is to discover that it had timber bands in it. And so we found that, that family in, uh, um, as well. And this young man was the son of this one, and this man had built the house, or had it built 50 years ago. And behind it, it had a band. And so these people were also interviewed by the same film team from Nova. And the quality of the masonry, though, I think hides more, because they didn't find bands higher up in the structure. But, I, uh, but in, in, in the, this is the band that I'm now doing the wire. So moving on to that, this is the kind of fracturing of the rubble stone masonry that these bands are in, intended to prevent. The team of people, the family, and the, and the hired masons are here, just as you saw in the Pakistan picture of them listening to a, uh, a class. This is the only class I gave of what are we going to do here. And I had two wonderful volunteers, Nepali uh, Lakpa Sherpa, you know, last name Sherpa. It's interesting to compare the height. It turns out this family is a delete family, the lowest caste. And so this wonderful, he was wonderfully strong, but look at the difference in their sizes. He had just graduated from the University of California, Berkeley, and it was a, his professor who introduced us. And he moved back to Nepal for the first time after he had finished his degree, two days before I arrived there. And then this man was a man I just uh, uh, never met before, but uh, found uh, just from his writings on the internet and started communicating with, and he had, had a, uh, a, P a bachelor's engineering degree and then an environmental science degree as well. And so it was very much a coincidence, and they were my translators and, and, uh, and co-workers, in effect. And here, just to give you a sense as to how, what impact this has had, this is a peanut gallery of neighbors come to watch what's going on. <laughs> and uh, what I've learned since from the American uh, and, and his wife is that there must be about 20 different uh, families in this town who want to use the same technology. But here, here is the, how the project began. And uh, the first level of the uh, Gabian is as simple as this. And, uh, and then uh, the wrapping of stone now is, has been done, and the uh, next level is being done. And then we were blessed by the gods, just as we were this morning. I, I couldn't resist um, this morning adding this. <laughs> For those of you who didn't see it. <laughs> Uh, but the little house is this, and, uh, and, it, and compared to some of the wonderful architecture and craftsmanship and sculptures that we've seen this week, I don't claim this to be an architectural, um, you know, have any architectural claims. Uh, but what's interesting is to compare it to the house that fell down, and you can see the kinship between the front of this and the front of that uh, in it. And it's a, just a basic house of what had been a two-sections house. The other part was not built here, and, and, uh, and, and, the, and normally the houses had a couple of stories. But it, at least it's a house. And the other thing that I insisted they have is that one of the things that was a really a revelation is to discover that almost none of these rural Nepali houses, and in, in fact many of the urban ones, did not have chimneys. <laughs> They had open wood fires to cook their dinners in open wood fires in the middle of the living room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you throw it, he's going to keep coming back. 
I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> decision on the spot. The other story there is in fact a kind of really emotional sad story. This is Ram, the son of the family whose house this will be. And I discovered after the construction was nearly complete that in fact his father had committed suicide exactly a year to the day after we finished the house. And here he is, shaved his head for the memorial for him, which will be the next day. And it's a sad story. But uh, they, one of the things that, that comes with it. And I insisted there be a window on the side of this house. And the local masons had said that it's unusual to have more than just that front window, that they had really dark rooms, that many of these people lived in really dark rooms. Uh, they didn't have picture windows that, that we're used to in, in country houses. But uh, I, this is his first view out this window. Oh and at the view from that village. And I had to, I just couldn't imagine myself being involved in building a house without it. Thank you very much. So um, I'm going to uh, show a six minute video by uh, playing it uh, outside of the PowerPoint link. Thank you. 
Because it's not allowed to cut oh, yeah. to a national park. Yeah. Uh, no. so, so, She's wrapped. Yeah. My finger was like this. It rolled up, so. Yeah, look at them. I'm not sure. 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 I'm not s